How's everybody doing today? I know I shook all of your hands. Good, good. This isn't a seminar. We're not here to, you know, get everybody to jump and do cartwheels and all that. What we're going to do is just take it one step at a time. The first thing that I'm going to go over, everyone, is, the t you know, the tape that you heard, the live seminar from Hawaii? What we're going to do here is I'm going to go through a basic semi uh, seminar-type atmosphere for the first two hours. So this way, th which is in the beginning of your book, the introduction, the beginning, so on and so forth. I'm going to show you how I started off and how I did in detail each and every one of those deals. Now, please save all your questions for after lunch. We're going to have a mentor session at that moment. So let's get started here. First of all, is everybody here from the New Jersey seminar? I know some are from Philadelphia. Philadelphia, OK. OK. And we have some people from Connecticut here. All right, so basically, well, we can't see that. OK, now, let's go through some of these things here. All right, now, as I said, rem you remember this from the tapes. You remember this also from the seminar. That true success is to reach and discover your maximum potential. And that's to become the person you were meant to be. Now, do you all remember reading this in the book, How the Government Can Make You Wealthy? Did everyone read the course? OK, did everyone listen to the tapes? OK, great. If not, just you know, follow along, because I know that this is only a few weeks you know, that you own this course here. Now, what we're going to do is go through the beginning. Now, what I mean by this, as I said on my tapes, is that to become the person you were meant to be, you may be prosperous in peace, wealth, or rich in romance. Or you could have all three, depending on the person you were meant to be. You know, some people, you know, they, they might want to only go so high in their life. Other people, you know, might want to be a billionaire in their life. But it's really the person that you were meant to be, okay? So understand what I mean by that. We're all different people. We all have different ambitions and goals. Okay, all we have to do is just click it on, and we will become the person that we were meant to be. Now, I told you about how I decided in my life. We have to work smarter, not harder, in our life. Okay, and that is this, is that, is that you know that when I was younger, I used to work in a factory, and I used to work 108 hours a week, and I used to polish cars and park cars and, and sell hot dogs, okay? But as I said in the seminars, that, that when I used to do these things, I went up to a bank, I knew that the wealthiest people in the United States were involved with real estate, and, uh, but I went to the bank to get a loan, a line of credit, and they asked me what I do, and I said, well, I polish cars, I park cars, and I sell hot dogs, and that didn't get me anywhere. Okay, so what we had to do was I had to start getting involved with the knowledge. And I went out and I looked for a two-family dwelling. Now, you remember this two-family dwelling from the, the seminar. And I'm going to tell you something about this two-family dwelling. Now, remember when I said this green thing, right? Now, this green thing is the beginning of my life. Now, let me tell you about the beginning of my life. I went around and I looked for a two-family dwelling. And this two-family dwelling here was a multi-family dwelling. That was a two-family. It wasn't a single-family home. Remember what I said to you about a single-family homes? The reason why that I didn't want to invest in single-family homes is because if I was in the mode of buying and selling and buying and selling, that would be one thing. But I'm not. I like to keep. But also, times do change. Like right now, we're in a tough time to sell. It's a good time to buy. Now. If all of a sudden I want to buy a single family home, and if I can't sell it, I have to hold on to it for six months, a year, what, how am I going to make that mortgage payment? I have to rent it out. But if I rent it out and if it's vacant, or, or if the tenant moves, I'm 100% vacant. But if I have a two family home and someone moves out, I'm only 50% vacant. If I have a four family home and someone moves out, I'm only 25% vacant. Remember something, me knowing where I am today, is that I know that it's just as easy to buy a 10-family home as it is a single-family home. So what's the problem? And as long as we have creative financing, it doesn't matter how large of a building we get into. But within your first six months, I honestly have to say to you, please, start with two-family, three-family, and four-family dwellings. How many people here are, are already beyond that? Already beyond that. OK. So. So good. So when I speak about that, I'm gonna, you know, I, I can talk from the basis, from the foundation. Okay, we'll start from the beginning here. Now, does everybody understand what I mean by that? By percentages, work with percentages. If you buy a single family home for $150,000, you're buying it for $150,000 a unit. 
If you buy a two-family home for $200,000, you're buying it for $100,000 a unit. A 10-family home for $500,000, you're buying it for $50,000 a unit. But you see, with our knowledge of Section 8 rentals, if it's a two-bedroom or a three-bedroom in a 100-unit complex or in a one-family, we still get the same amount of rent. So we might as well decrease our debt factor, okay, and increase our cash flow. Now, does everybody understand that? All right. Now, that's why I said that every time you buy, please write this down. Every time you buy, you should increase your cash flow and increase your net worth. Now, a lot of people looked at that two-family dwelling over there, that first two-family dwelling, and they said to me, oh, don't buy that property. That's no good. I listened to all these dream destroyers telling me it can't be done. But yet, let me tell you something about that, that green house over there is that first of all, in order to increase your cash flow, okay, we're going to be looking for Section 8 rentals. Also, to increase your net worth, we're going to be looking for grant money. Now, obviously, grant money is going to increase your net worth because if we get $50,000 in grant money from the United States government, that means we just created $50,000 in extra equity. Isn't that right? That's right, so if I gave you $50,000 to put into your building, that's $50,000 that now you don't have to go to the bank and borrow. You see, that's instant equity. And that is the two rules of real estate. Every time you buy, you should increase your cash flow, and every time you buy, you should increase your net worth. Now, this is what happened with this particular property. I purchased this property for a total investment okay, of $53,000. Now, the gentleman was asking $55,000 back in 1985. Now, listen to this close because this was the first property I ever bought in my life. Now, I purchased this property here. Don't pay attention to these numbers just yet. But I purchased that green property for $53,000. Now, the gentleman wanted $55,000. Now, at the same time, everyone else was offering him $35,000, right? $35,000, $40,000 at maximum. So I knew this, you see. And I said to him, look, I said, would you sell me this property if you held back 100% of the mortgage? Now, he owned this property free and clear. I found five people, investors, you know, people who owned their homes, and some were investors who owned these homes, free and clear, two family dwellings. So four of them told me to get lost. The fifth one said to me, well, tell me more. I said, well, how about if I make this into a good investment opportunity for you? I said, number one, what I want to do is I would like you to hold back 100% financing for only a three-year period. I said, by doing this, okay, by, you know, by doing this, you know, number one, you'll be put into a better tax situation. Now, at the time, I didn't really know tax laws, okay? Now, even though, you know, anytime you need to know uh, any type of tax law, you must consult a, an, a, an accountant. It's very important. I'm not here to give accounting advice because even my, you know, myself, I have, to, I have an accountant. It's very important because that's what accountants are paid for, to, keep, to make sure that you're doing things correctly <coughs> as far as taxes are concerned. But anyway, so I went out and I got this property. And I had him, I talked to him about holding back 100% financing. I said, if you do this, I will pay you your full price of $55,000. And he said to me, wait, you mean to tell me you'll pay me $55,000? And I said to him, yes, and in three years, I'll pay you 100%. I'll pay you off. I'll pay you a mortgage, a regular mortgage, each and every month, and then on the third year, I'll pay you completely off. Now, here's this guy saying to himself, look at this kid. At the time, I was 21 years old. He said, I'm going to hold back the mortgage. He said to me, Neil, um, are you going to fix things if things go wrong? And, you know, are you, are you going to take care of everything? I said, of course. It's my building. So he said to me, he said to me, well, well, he said to himself, he must have said, well, look at this crazy guy. He doesn't know what the heck he's doing. He's going he's gonna to tell me that he's going to wait three years and then pay me off the $55,000 for this property. He's, going to, he's not going to be able to afford to pay me in three years, so I'm going to take the building back, and in the meantime, he's going to fix everything up, right? If something goes wrong, he's going to fix it up. So let me tell you what, now he agreed to that. Now, by the way, I looked through the property for pre-inspection, and I noticed some things that had to be done. Like, for instance, in my contract, it stated that mechanical, uh, it had a mechanical clause, like stoves had to be working and drains had to be working, things like that. 
So I, I had him deduct $2,000 off that purchase price, and he agreed because I just wouldn't have done the deal. Okay, so it brought, in, brought it down to $53,000. So I purchased that property for $53,000. Now, here's the situation. I purchased the property, now $53,000. I went in with no money down. But let me tell you something, folks. That's, I looked at this book amortization book and I realized that the day I bought this property that I would have had a positive cash flow so did I overpay for that property if I had a positive cash flow the day that I bought it no no way no way and the thing is, is that so many people are so worried about price all the time that they lose the deal because I might have paid fifteen thousand dollars more for that property but they let's let's take a look at what happened okay let's take a look at what happened to my surprise, two years later, I wanted to sell the property so I could pay off the guy in the third year. Mm -hmm. I thought the property was worth about $75,000, but only in real estate could things like this be done. The property appraised at $125,000 from 1985 to 1987. Something very strange happened in the United States, okay? And you're going to see this happened around 1993 to 1995, okay? It's like a seven-year cycle that this property went up to $125,000. And I didn't make up these numbers. The bank sent down an appraiser, yeah. okay? So I said, okay, well, I learned about refinancing at that time. And we'll talk about refinancing in, in a, a little bit later on. So what I did at that moment, if I took out the bank, I went down to the bank, the bank was willing to give me 80% of the $125,000. You understand, 80% loan to value. All right, so let's just say, folks, if this property was worth $100,000, the bank is only willing to give me $80,000 for that $100,000 property. You follow? So I could have pulled out $100,000 on $125,000, but I didn't because I, look in my, I looked in my amortization book and I said, well, wait a minute. I said, I'll have a negative cash flow. That's no good. So I decided to pull out $75,000. Now, in two years, I was giving him nothing but principal payments, right, within that time because of my positive cash flow. Because at the time, I heard that you should, you know, cut down your principal a lot. So I owed $47,500 two years later. So it came out to be, so, so $47,500 I refinanced for $75,000. $47,500 taken away from that equals $27,500. Now, I had closing costs, meaning points from the bank, and I also had an attorney's fee. Now, it left me with, with $25,000 in cash, $25,000 of tax-free cash. Why is that tax-free, folks? Because it's borrowed money, and we have to pay it back, so we're not taxed on that money. But who is paying that money back if I have a positive cash flow? My tenants were. So I got this money in my pocket. I could have done anything I wanted with that property. Now, folks, remember, I, told, I don't know if you remember this, but when I was 18 years old, J.C. Penney and Sears sent me credit cards. Remember that story? I didn't know you had to pay those things back, right? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I waited, and then it was $18 a month, and I let the money accumulate. And then about a year later, I said, oh, well, I'll let it accumulate to something, and then I'll pay them off, right? I was wrong. I destroyed my credit completely. But remember something, folks. I went into this property with an individual as my bank, right? I established credit for two years because I owned my own property. That's why the bank refinanced this property. It was fabulous, you see? It, it, was, it was so incredible at the time. It was, it, it's really amazing how you can do this. And, now, and, and what other type of business could you make $25,000 in? I mean, it was fabulous to me. I couldn't believe that. Now, you know, that was the worst deal I ever did in my life. That's why I say about attorneys and stuff like that, that everybody says, oh, I don't want to pay an attorney 500 bucks. But the thing is this. He can save you. So what am I going to do? Make 24 5 and, and, and complain about the $500? That's right. You see what I'm saying? So, folks, you've got to use attorneys to get yourself, you know. Well, sometimes they've been burned by bad attorneys. Yes. Well, the, well the thing is, is that that's why you have to find good and loyal yeah. attorneys. Now, anyway. So, folks, I had $50,000 in equity, and I still had a positive cash flow, right? $125,000 minus $75,000 equals $50,000 in equity. 
And what did I do with that 25000 Folks, go out and buy a Lamborghini or put a deposit on a Lamborghini? No way. What did I say about Lamborghinis, right? Lamborghini, who do we impress? You know, if somebody pulled up to me in a Lamborghini, you think I'm impressed by that? No way. They pull up in a Lamborghini, you think I'm going to say, oh, I, I want to be his partner. He must be smart. The thing is that that doesn't tell me anything. You think that I'm impressed by a Lamborghini or Donald Trump's impressed by a Lamborghini? No way. Because if that, who does that impress? That imp doesn't impress. It impresses the common person. And unfortunately, the common person's broke. So why are we going to be common, folks? <laughs> Knock it off. Obviously, you're not common because you're here. You see? So that's the whole thing. We don't have to worry about impressions. That's for, your ego is later. I will borrow for profit and not for ego. Write that down, please. I didn't make sure that you all wrote that down, but I will borrow for profit, not for ego. And that's the bottom line. So that's what I did with this property. Instead of going out and putting a deposit on a Porsche, I went out and I purchased, I, I made a deal on this property. Now, if you remember, this property also was a two-family dwelling. Now, this property here uh, was really something else. I wound up living in this property. And uh, I had nurses living upstairs because I was right across the street from a, 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 a hospital. Now, the greatest thing is, is this. If you're not going to be buying in low-income areas, I'm going to tell you right now, buy everything you can get around a hospital. Boy, fabulous. See, something's happening right now. Nurses are coming over from the Philippines, and they don't want to walk, they don't want to drive to work because they don't have cars, right? And they don't want to go too far away because they don't want to walk too far and take buses. So what they want to do is live within walking distance from, the, from their, their hospital. And now these properties, I'm getting top dollar for the rental of these properties because one, one I have a five-bedroom apartment, right? For that particular apartment there, I'm getting $1,250, but that's a little bit under value there. Hello there. Um, I can get more than that but the, because each person who's living in a bedroom, if I have a two-bedroom apartment and if the Filipino nurses are making, you know, they're making very good money and, they, and there's two nurses per bedroom, so think about their income compared to $800 a month for a two-bedroom. That's nothing. They're willing to pay top dollar because it's right across the street. But at the same time, you're going to make their apartment very nice, you see, and be good to these people because I get my, I'll tell you, I get my rent sometimes 15 days in advance from the Filipino nurses. So what I would suggest that if you're not going to also, if you, if you the, the first file a little bit, if you're going to, if you have an opportunity around hospitals, buy everything you can get around those hospitals, please. Multi-family, meaning two-family, three-family, four-family homes. I will promise you that there's no way that you're going to have a vacancy in those areas. And that's it. Also, there's Filipino, uh, what, what there is is that there's Filipino um, uh, little, little uh, groups and stuff like that who will even help house the people coming over from the Philippines. Like recently, over in Perth Amboy, New Jersey, 11 Filipino nurses came over. And, want, and were started to work in the hospital, and they needed uh, housing, so they contacted me. But unfortunately, you know, well, fortunately, I don't have any vacancies, okay? And, and, and the thing is, is that, uh, I, unfortunately, I couldn't house them, okay? Because, you know, why am I going to have property that, that are vacant? Right now, I have a 0% vacancy factor. Okay, now, let me tell you about that property. Is that this property here I, was... The guy, the, I had it appraised for $135,000 by the bank. Now, I needed, I, what, what, at the time I was, um, I needed $108,000. Now, folks, let me tell you what happened on this property. This property, I negotiated to $120,000. Now, 80% of 135 equals $108,000. Does everybody follow? That's 80% loan to value of the property. Now, let me tell you how I pulled this one off. This particular uh, loan is called an appraisal loan. Not all banks will give you that. No way, and they're getting tighter, especially right now during this SNL thing, where every, the SNL crisis, where everyone else is backing up and getting tighter, the financial institutions, is that they're, they're, it's going to be very hard to get an appraisal loan. So what happened was, at this particular time, this was my second property ever, it was appraised at $135,000. So it was a local bank small bank, so they were willing to do it for me. So that $108,000 was coming from the financial institution. So I was able to work out a deal for $120,000. That was my purchase price. 
Now, folks, remember something. This, why would a man sell his property or a woman sell his property for $120,000 if it's worth $135,000? Well, at the time, what happened was is that he went out and he purchased himself another home to move in. And he thought that, like 1985, the day you put on a, something on the market, it'll be sold. 1986, like that. But he was wrong. It was hard for him to sell this property. So he purchased the other property in advance, and now he had two mortgages. He was living in this one, and he had uh, a townhouse. So how is he going to do that? He had a discount somehow. So I went to him at the right time, and he was I was able to negotiate a purchase price of 120. Now, deferring the payments. Do you all remember the section on deferring the payments? We'll go on that in detail before the end of this day. All right, now this is what happened. As I asked him, I said, look, I'll give you the 120, providing you defer the payments of $12,000. Now, how did I come up with that figure of $12,000? $120,000 minus $108,000 that the bank was giving me equals $12,000 deposit. Now, what I did was this. I said to him, look, I want you to defer the payments of $12,000. He said to me, no way. I said to him, look, I'll give you $120,000, and I'll make it into a good investment opportunity for you. He said, well, tell me more. I said to him, well, if you defer this $12,000, I'll give you 10% interest on this money. I will pay you on this property. Now, I, I suggested at the time to defer all the payments until the third year. But the thing is that he didn't want to agree. He wanted principal and interest payments each month. I think it came out to be $110 a month. Okay, at the time, it was $110, $111, something like that each and every month that I had to give him. So I finally agreed. I said, okay. So now, remember what happened. He put this lien, remember something about deferred payments, he put this lien on a secondary property, and we'll talk about that when we discuss deferring payments. Okay, you don't want to put that lien on, a, on the property that you're purchasing. You want to put it on a secondary property. So we'll discuss that a little bit later. So anyway, now, I went into this property with absolutely no deposit. Now folks, remember something. I still had that $25,000 for my first deal, right? So this gave me the confidence I needed to go out and do other deals. A funny thing happened to me yesterday. I signed a contract on a warehouse. I bought a warehouse for a senior citizen project, okay? And I'm sitting with the guy, and I had a clause in there. And as a matter of fact, this is the contract right here. We're going to go over this later on. But I had a clause in there that he's going to pay for my points because I'm, I'm bypassing a real estate agent that he would have had to pay 10 points to. And I said to him, well, if you're paying 10 points to him, at least pay my three points over at the bank. He said, oh, come on, Neil. But you know, the problem is I couldn't say anything because it's a, it's a vacant warehouse. I can't say that the toilet bowl doesn't work or this doesn't work. You know, so I had no negotiation tools. So I said to him, well, I said, bring it to your attorney. If he wants to cross it off, you know, then submit it to me at that time. Because for the first time, you know, if you're buying something like just that doesn't have anything in it, Nothing, just a building, just a square nothing. You know, there was nothing I can say. So, so the thing is, is that sometimes, uh, you know, with buildings like that, you don't really have a way to prove to them that they should pay for your points. Here, I had a way that he, I, that to, uh, for, him to prove for, uh, for him to pay for my points. So now, I went into this property with absolutely not a dime. I said to myself, this could really be done. I couldn't believe it. Now I have two properties, okay, and I still have $25,000 in cash. Then I looked at this property here. I said, oh, no, I don't want to start getting into these areas because I remember when a real estate agent said to me, Neil, don't ever buy a property that the plumbing doesn't work. Don't ever buy a property that the electrical needs repair and so on and so forth. So I went around bumping into walls saying, oh, that plumbing is in bad shape? Well, forget it. I lost so many good deals because this person, right, told me not to do this. Yeah. Now, you know what the funny thing about this person is? Is that when I first started, I said to him, how many buildings do you own? He goes, nine. I said, nine buildings? I can't believe that. I said, I wonder if I'm ever going to own nine buildings. People, please understand, my biggest ambition in life was to live rent free. That's all I wanted. Don't ever forget where I came from. Don't ever forget that I sat in the third 
grow, sometimes in the last row at seminars, listening to people telling me how wealthy they were. I never thought that I would be where I am in this short amount of time, okay? And I'm going to make a statement here that's very important for everyone to understand something. That the day that I, you know why you purchased this course here on how the government can make you wealthy? Let me tell you why. Because the day that I find someone in the United States who made more money than I did their first three years in business, their first three years in business, I'm not talking about their 31st to the 34th, I'm not talking about their 20th to the 23rd, I'm talking about their first three years, then I'd be doing what they're doing. Like that. Believe me, I'd be doing what they're doing. And I travel this great land in the United States everywhere. I've traveled 15 to 20,000 miles a month, and I have yet found that. Anyone who I speak to, the day I find someone who had made $8.8 .8 million in three years then, or more, if they made more than that, I'd be doing it. And that's the bottom line. So understand why you're here. And not only that, but you pay taxes, right? Remember when I said that you all pay taxes here? Isn't it about time we get some of that money back? You know what I'm saying? If you look at it on that angle, which is very important. So anyway, I looked at this property. Oh, by the way, that guy with the nine buildings? I say to him now, three years later, how many buildings do you own? He goes, nine. <laughs> yeah, he's an investor, right? He got lucky, and the thing is, is that he, because he had a lot of cash, okay, to dump into these properties. Now, he has no cash, so he doesn't know where he's going. He can't go into another property. That's why creativity makes you go over those walls, all right? Now, let me tell you about this property. This property here was in a targeted area. Does everybody understand what targeted areas are now? With, with the rental rehabilitation program, please hear people, you're here to learn. Does everybody understand that? Yes or no? Does anybody not understand it? Okay. Yes, sir. Right. I know. Isn't that a shame? But I got them all right here, okay, in the state of New Jersey. Believe me, I call up people around the United States, and, and it's like I even, sometimes I call it like Philadelphia is ridiculous. It's like you have to go through so much red tape. Remember something, don't be confused between the state agency and city agencies. If you're in an area, let's just say like um, Pennsylvania, a lot of people call up Pittsburgh or Pennsylvania or, or Philadelphia thinking, oh, can I have your housing authority or can I have your Department of Community Development and, and Economic Development? And then they'll say, well, okay, and they'll give him the or her the Philadelphia Housing Authority instead of the State Housing Authority, you see, or the State DCA. And the thing is, is that don't be confused between the two. You have to deal with the state level, and that's the problem. Yeah, but you have to have the right telephone numbers. But in the meantime, I'll give them to you, okay? And you can order this here, and it's for free from this state. It's amazing how easy, how easy uh, th things are. Is there a woman here, I, I forget her last name, Anna, is there somebody here by the name of Anna? Last name starts with a C. No, Anna, what's her name? Okay, Cifarelli or something like that. Well, anyway, Anna call, sends me a fax, okay? And she's supposed to be here today. And Anna sends me this fax, and in the fax it says, it says, I called up Washington, D.C. and all this other stuff, and I'm having such a hard time, and I called up all the state agencies. So I had Jerry in the back give her a call, give her one little telephone number. She sends me this big letter. Oh, oh, I got everything, you know. And, and the thing is, is that all these, this red tape that we have to go through, I mean, it's getting to be ridiculous in this country. But it is getting better. Let me tell you that. It used to be really terrible, but now it's getting better. And you know why I get all the information that I need to know? Because I have persistence. I have the confidence that this is law in the United States, okay? And that's the bottom line. The American people to have support and assistance, they are entitled to under the law. Jack Kemp. Jack Kemp is the head of HUD. Okay? And these are laws. And always remember that. So if you all of a sudden move to Texas, it's there. If you move to Seattle, Washington, it's there. Boston, it's there. Don't ever let anyone tell you different. Dave Daldalo's personal attorney said to me, it's not in Hawaii. I said, come on, it's law. Is it the United States? He said, yes. I said, it's there. He said to me, no, Neil, I tried. I said, wait a minute. I looked up. I said, call this number. He called up the number. 
him and John Paulison. Remember John Paulison? He runs the Millionaire School. They go over into the office. He, they said to me that the guy was like the Maytag repairman, just like sitting there. He opened up their arms to them. He said, here, here, have your own office. He let them make phone calls and everything else, right? They got themselves $750,000 in grants, and that's the bottom line. Okay, and they told me that it couldn't be done. I said, come on, guys, you guys are too, uh, you know, optimistic to tell me this. You know, but I suppose if you say, if you hear the word no so much, you, you finally change or you finally turn around. But let me tell you something. Remember what it says in my course about the word no. You take that word as a challenge instead of a setback. Every time somebody tells me no, you know, the more times people tell me no, the more, the more I know I'm going to get the property. Okay, and, and <laughs> that's it. You know, now let's discuss this property here. I received grant money on this property. This was in the targeted area. You see, if you buy, go out and you buy an average foreclosure, or if you buy an REO, or if you buy any type of property for sale by owner, no matter what you buy, as long as you buy it in a targeted area, and in some states there are no targeted areas, that you get grant money on top of that. So if you bought that foreclosure, and made $50,000 on that deal, and you're doing cartwheels and you're so happy, if the government gives me $30,000 in grant money to rehabilitate that property, that's instant equity. Folks, I want you to realize that that same deal you just made $80,000 on, in equity. Do you understand that? Okay, if you don't, then we'll, you know, I'll answer questions later on. Now, let's discuss this property here. I received grant money on this property. This was in the targeted area. Now, I knew that Pauline Parkin was my, the, the woman that I wanted to contact in the city of Perth Amboy. So I give her a call, and, I, and I, had, I had a little meeting with her on grant money. So she told me, she said, Hall Avenue, this and that, is all the targeted areas in this city. So I went around, and I saw this property. Now, let me discuss this property with you. I was able to go into this property. I had the gentleman hold back a deferred payment of $10,000. Now, I'm being repetitive, folks, for a reason. I want you to understand this. $140,000, he held back $10,000. I had to come up with $18,000. Remember, folks, remember that $25,000 I had for my first deal? Well, that's where it came from. So in the meantime, my rehabilitation at the time cost me $57,000. I didn't have 57000 I went to the bank. I said, well, you give me a construction loan? They said, no way. I, I said, well, why not? So, so anyway, so I went down there, and I said, well, $57,000. I can't get 57000 So I put an ad in the newspaper, and I got, myself, I got myself an investor. And that investor, I wound up giving 15% on his money in three months. In three months. You think maybe he told his friends about me? He surely did, but at that time... I showed what a good job I did, and the bank wanted to deal with me. So anyway, <laughs> so $57,000 equals $197,000 into the property. Now, I received only $20,000 in grant money, but folks, I say only, but that's still $20,000 in free money. At the time, you can only receive on a national level $5,000 per unit. You follow? But now it's $5,000 for a studio, $6,500 for a one-bedroom, $7,500 for a two-bedroom, and $8,500 for a three-bedroom. You follow? Now, so that brought my cost down to $177,000 on the property. In three months later, that property appraised at $281,000. You know why that property appraised at $281,000? Because, number one, I had new, new, I had new everything in the property, okay? Well, this particular property, I did not gut out. It was my first rehab job. I did something called minor rehab. Kitchens, bathrooms, carpeting, sprucing up. You see painting, things like that. Put on a new back deck, stuff like that. So that, that's what I did there. And then I received my Section 8 tenants in this property. Now, this property had an average rental of $180 a month when I first bought it per unit. After I got in Section 8, it was taking in, I think, the building approximately $3,200 a month, okay? That's what made it appraise at $281,000. Ever since this property, every property I've ever bought within my first three to four months, because that's how long it took me to rehabilitate the property, 
every time I did that, my properties doubled and tripled within the first three to four months, every time. Now, $281,000. I refinanced for $180,000, had to pay back my construction money, okay? Had to pay off my first mortgage. That's $180,000, it came out to be exactly. I had $101,000 in equity in this property. $101,000 in equity, and I had $1,000 a month positive cash flow in my pocket. Even though I refinanced, I still had a positive cash flow of $1,000 a month. I could have refinanced for $200,000 and only had a positive cash flow of $600 a month, but I wanted that positive cash flow, you see? And, and I just wanted to make sure that I had a lot of positive cash flow because that's what's important to me. And that's the bottom line. So that was this deal. So this was all the start of all the rental rehabilitation program. Now see this property here? Now a gentleman came up to me, I explained this one in my book, and said to me, Neil, you know, you want to be my partner in this property? And he said to me, yes. I said to him, yes, rather. And, and I looked at it and I said, oh, this property's terrible. I said, I can't do this property. I said, the, the floors are all wavy and everything else. I said, everything is terrible in this property. I said, this is exactly what that guy told me not to buy. The plumbing was bad and everything else. So this was the first major rehab job I ever did. So, and I had a partner on this deal. So we wound up getting some grant money and we fixed it up. Now this property, I wound up buying out my partner and it was appraised. I purchased this property for $98,000 and this property was re financed at $302,000 four months later. Okay, so I bought out my partner and we went, you know, we went our separate ways with this particular property. And then I filled up this property with Section 8 tenants also. Now, remember something about rental rehabilitation, tenants, is that as you are not allowed to evict the people already living in these buildings, okay, in this state of New Jersey. Some states you can. But in this state of New Jersey, you cannot evict them. But the greatest thing of all is that with this particular, oops, let me go back to that. The greatest thing of all is that with this program, the rental rehabilitation program, if the people are in that building are already existing, who already live there, they will automatically qualify for Section 8, okay, providing they're in the correct income standard. Okay, in the in, uh, for, uh, correct income criteria, I should say. Alrighty. Now, if they're not, that means they can afford to pay the new rents. In this program, the rental rehabilitation, rent control does not apply and rent stabilization does not apply. So therefore, you can move the tenant's rent from $200 a month up to $886 a month, let's just say, for a three-bedroom apartment. But here's the change now. The only difference is, is that in my time, I only ran across one person who wouldn't qualify. They were making like $40,000 a, a, you know, a year. And I said to him, why are you living here? Why don't you go out and buy your own property? He said, no, because I like it here. So I, went, so I called up, you know, I called up the, uh, the housing specialist, and I said to him, what do I do in this situation? You know, I had to call up New Brunswick here. And they said, well, you have to raise their rents. And if they, they want to move, then they'll move. And the thing is, is that I moved up their rents, and they could afford it. Remember that, folks, these people have to pay one-third their income. This guy could have afforded $1,200 a month in rent. You see what I'm saying? So they wind up staying and paying the full amount because they've been getting away with that $180 a month rent all those years, you see? And that's the thing. That's the bottom line. So I want you to understand that and don't let anybody tell you different because when you go up to your local housing authority to get a Section 8 tenant in your property, see, there's people on that list to to three years waiting to, to go out and get good housing, safe, decent, sanitary housing. Now the situation is, is the greatest thing is that if we buy a people, uh, building with people already existing, they automatically qualify. That's fabulous, okay, for us, the landlord, all right, because what we're doing here is creating safe, decent, sanitary housing for good. Don't ever, 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 a lot of people say to me, oh, you mean you own those properties down there, so therefore, oh, oh, I see, so you're a slumlord, no. We get rid of slumlords. We kick them in the pants and get rid of them, you see? And the thing is, th is this, is that you have to take care of your tenants and take care of your properties. My, my, tur my, my, my tenants, I give turkeys once a year to, okay? I mean, you know, I mean, to eat, 
to enjoy themselves, to say, thank you very much for being my tenant, and here you go, here's a turkey, and that's it. All right? So, so yes, I think that's very important. And remember, for a little turkey, everybody loves you. Okay? And, and that's it. So now, that's number one. The, Bernice Banks from the Housing Authority from Perth Amboy is coughing back there. I think she's coughing on one of those pieces of turkey. <laughs> now I'm only kidding. <laughs> but anyway, but anyway uh, here we go. All right, so then, you know, three partners and I, we got involved with this property. Okay, we ended up putting senior citizens up there. This particular property here. This, now, look at this. Remember I talked about this property? How many people would not buy this property? I know you all would because, you, you know, you're already involved with the program. But I looked at this property and I said, oh, no. I said, I can't buy this property. Remember what I said about this property? I said, wait a minute now. But then I said, Neil, just keep on thinking negotiation factor. Just remember that you can deduct money for every window that's missing there. Okay, off the purchase price. Okay, so, so what I did was, I looked at it and I went, oh no, I can't believe it. Right? And I looked at this over here, oh man, terrible, huh? Let me tell you something about this property. Yeah, well, let me tell you something about this property, okay? And, and Bernice could vouch for this. This property was so bad that the cockroaches committed suicide. <laughs> Okay, I'm telling you something, all right? But anyway, the thing is, is that this was terrible. But then I said, wait a minute. Now I don't have to pull the sheetrock off. Huh? No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> but anyway, but the thing is, it's already gone, right? No, seriously. So I, I, I fix it up a little bit, okay? And I sort of fix it up there. And, and now the back porch is a little bit more fixed up. And let me tell you something. I'm very proud of the interior of this property. Okay, it came out really, really beautiful. I have four units upstairs and a store downstairs. Now, let me tell you about this deal. I purchased this property, again, with no money down because I had the seller defer the payments. You see, it's better for them because I, wouldn't, I would never give them the price. I would never gi have given her $120,000 for this property. I would have given her one hundred and ten, dollars and she knew it if I had to pay her cash, right? But the thing is, is that, is that she was willing to hold back the, the paper. She was willing to defer the payments. So I made it into a better investment opportunity for her. So now the purchase price was 120. My rehabilitation, meaning my architectural plans, my law fees, my variance approvals, everything cost me $70,000 for the rehabilitation of this property. I had $190,000 total into the property. Remember folks, that $70,000 is now construction loans. Do you remember reading that in your ha rehab handbook? Do you re did you read that in your ha rehab handbook yet, yeah. folks? Okay, about, about the uh, construction loans. So now I received $29,000 in grant money. I had $161,000 uh, into the property total. The property appraised three and a half months. It was between three and four months later at $325,000 based on income. The property was taking in $3,800 a month. I have $180,000 I refinanced the property for to pay off my construction loan and my first mortgage. I have $145,000 in equity in the property and a $1,600 a month positive cash flow in my pocket after all bills. Yes? You appraised the property um, after your rehab. Yes. Do you appraise it as a uh, dependent appraiser or do you go to the bank? Uh, what I do is go out and go to the bank because the bank is the one, you know, only larger corporate banks such as First Fidelity Bank they'll want you to go out and get your own appraisal done, okay, MIA appraiser. But um, as, far as, as far as the, um, the, the small local banks are concerned, they usually insist on you using certain certified appraisers. Okay, so therefore this particular one was a certain certified appraiser, it wasn't my own appraiser, and I said, what the heck do I care? You know, if he's appraising it at $325,000, but he's basing it based on income. Remember, my first property that I bought on this street, my first property that I bought in, on the street, you know, it was hard to appraise because there was no comparables. So I insisted that they appraise it based on income. Now, then I started to own a lot of property on the street. Now they started to have comparables, you see. So the average of the property values went up the more I did in that area, okay? And all these properties that I'm showing you here happen to be on the same street. I tell you, I'm thinking about changing the name of the street to a Riccio Boulevard. Yeah, that's good. Okay, isn't that a Riccio Boulevard? That sounds good. But anyway, <laughs> creative buying. Let me tell you what happened here. 
This particular one, I did not rehabilitate through grant money. What I did was, I received at the time a Title I loan, which was easy, easier to get to at the time. Okay, now, what I did was, I got involved with this property, and I saw this property sitting here, and I said, wait a minute now. I said, I went up to the bank. Oh, this is it, that's, that's right. I went up to the bank, and I sat down, and I, and I brought them in a deal. And I said, hey, all right, I got another deal, right? I had another contract, and I sat down with them. And he goes, Mr. Riccio, he goes, um, I got to tell you something. He, you know, I was hit with very unpleasant news. I said to him, I said to him, um, you know, what's, what's happening? And, uh, excuse me, Glenn, this is, if you don't mind, this is copyrighted material we cannot record. Okay, if you don't mind. Thank you very much. Anyway, so, so the whole situation is, is that uh, I went into the bank, and I said to the banker, I said, uh, I said so, so what's the matter? He said to me, well, he said, Neil, let me tell you something. He goes, he goes, you know, we cannot lend you any more money. I said, what? I said, every time I buy, my cash flow is increased, and every time I buy, my net worth is increased. What's the problem? He goes, Neil, we have a policy in this bank that an individual can only lend so much money. And I later found out that there is a federal regulation that you can only borrow so much money per bank, and that's it, what is it? depending on your income. Okay? So the situation is this is that I went in there and I sat down and I said, well, you know, what the heck am I going to do? You know, I, I couldn't believe that he told me that. So now, here's the situation. I met with this very unpleasant surprise and I said, well, well, I, I said, well, okay. I said, we'll see what we got to do now. So, so as I was leaving, he, he, the, the banker kept on trying to remind me how old I was. You know what I mean? You know, he was like, well, look, I'm 54 years old. You know, what do you, you got, got all these buildings. He goes, Neil, do you realize that you borrowed more money from this particular financial institution than anybody, he said, in this past, in one year, he said. He said, so, you know, he said, what's the problem? Slow up, you know. I love that when people tell me to, to you know, to slow up. Oh, you're going to regret your youth. You're going to regret your youth. Where am I going to be regretting it from? <laughs> from my own ship off the coast of Greece? You know what I'm saying? So, so really, that's, that's the thing. But I was blessed at a young age. And I don't care if you're 80 years old. The situation is, is that God bless you. At least you're starting now to make the rest of your life a very, very financially secure one. You see, because you could do more in the next three to five years than you did in your whole lifetime. You see? And that's the whole thing. And I'm very grateful for what I've done in the past few years. And I want you to understand that. And that's why I do these things. Okay? And I love it. And you know how much I love it because you were at my seminar. Okay, and you know how I love getting in front of a thousand people, you know. And as my whole motto is, is that, hey, even if I make $50 million doing this, well, God bless me, at least I'm helping people. And the bottom line is that I don't think I'll make as much as I make in real estate. And I really do real estate. I don't just talk about it. Listen to the people who do it, not just the people who tell you about it. You see what I'm saying? And that's another thing that I congratulate you people for. Okay, because that's what you're here for today. So anyway, I saw this property. I couldn't get any more loans. And I said, I said to the gentleman, I said, I, I went up to the investor. And I said to him, he was, a, he was an investor also. But yet, I wasn't really impressed because he just had this building sitting there and it wasn't going anywhere. I said to him, excuse me, Bob. I said, how much is this property costing you a month? He said, $1,350 a month. I said, $1,350 a month? I said, that's ridiculous. I said, what are you going to do with it? He goes, well, I'm going to wait about two years and then flip it. Now, folks, <laughs> now listen now. Now flip it, right? Who, how many of you, I, I thought maybe he was talking about pancakes or something. <laughs> I didn't know what he was talking about, you know, because I wasn't of the norm of real estate. The norm of real estate, you know, they have these certain terminology things, you see. You know, and I, you know what? Everybody was telling me at the time, not to buy, not to buy, but I didn't know what I was doing. So I was doing great, you see? But as soon as I started to learn about the market, then I started to lose a little bit. I started to slow up because I listened to the common person. So that's why you can't. We create our own market in low-income housing. That's what you have to understand, you see? There is no good times and bad times in low-income housing. There's always good times. You're always creating people for housing, that, uh, creating, creating uh, housing for people that otherwise wouldn't be living in a beautiful place. So they're going to be willing to pay for that.
the government. You see? And as I said before, it's about time we're getting some of this money back that we've been paying all these years. You see, remember that woman, Robin Hood, by the way? Remember she embezzled, like, what, what was it, $5 million in the past 10 years? Right? Remember that? Well, all I know is that in the past three years, I made, I mean, in my first two years, I made more than that. So if she just did her own thing legally, she would have been wealthy, right? And she wouldn't be in jail today. So I don't understand why people do these illegal acts. It doesn't make sense to me. So anyway, so I went into this property and I, I saw it and I said to him, look, Bob, why don't I come into this property? I'll fix up this property, okay? And then after I fix it up, if we refinance or to sell it, I'll split the property. I'll split, I'll, uh, you'll pay your out of the pocket cost for closing. I'll pay my out of the pocket cost for fixing it up cost. And then we'll split the profit and the property 50-50. He said, sure. Because he knew at the time the property was worth about $105,000. Okay? Then all of a sudden it shot up to $185,000. So he was willing to split that. At the and another thing is, is that I received Section 8 rents. And the Section 8 rents came from the housing authority of this particular township. Now, this did not come from the rental housing specialist through community affairs, okay, of your county office. This came right through the city, the, the, the city's uh, housing authority. Now, I get two separate checks each month. One comes right from the state, and one comes from the housing authority. So when you have vacancies, you see, you can always go to the housing authority and get your, your apartments filled up, providing that they're good, de decent, safe, sanitary housing. And they're going to do an inspection of your property. See, that's the problem, is that we don't want to be confused. Unfortunately, what happens is this, is that if you and I went into a housing authority and they told us, oh, well, you know, we don't have any more money for this fiscal year, we're going to, like, say, oh, we're going to, like, bust our balloon. But this is something that you think that they're ever going to stop such programs. No way. Just always remember that. No way. The day that we have no more homeless families, then we'll have a bunch of low-income families. And the day we have no more low-income families is the day they'll probably say no more program. Okay? I think there's plenty to go around. Believe me. And remember, you do this type of program like I did for the next two, three, four, five years, you won't ever need it again. And remember that. Okay? So that's it. And we're going to discuss that more in detail a little bit later on. Okay? So anyway, so I went to this property. I got in the Section 8 tenants. And now uh, my name is on half the deed, and I own this property 50-50. So, folks, I didn't even use a bank because we put my name on the deed. I own the property 50-50 because of my knowledge with repairs, right? I gave the gentleman, the investor, an opportunity to have a positive cash flow instead of paying $1,300 a month, right? So, therefore, now we're partners. You see what I'm saying? Do you think that you can do the same thing? Of course you can because knowledge is the key. The money comes easy. When you know what you're doing, okay, when you know what you're doing, people will back you. And that's it. And you, and you know that. If I showed you such deals that we were going to make a $1,600 positive cash flow a month, not put it, you know, do this and do that, and we're going to need, let's say, $20,000 for the first three months, and you knew you were going to double and triple your, you know, the value of the property and be able to double your cash, you know, you would do it. Of course you would. And that's the bottom line. That is so, so, so important. Now, now let's discuss, okay, this property here, terrible property. This happened to be on the same street, okay? I got some grant money. I fixed it up. I made some garages in the back because it looked like this. And I said, oh, I said, this is terrible. I said, why don't I utilize that space and make some garages, okay? And um, that's jammed over there. You want to just, like, push it a little bit? So anyway, so basically, the, the whole situation is, Eddie, can you, can you get that for me, please? Okay. And also, is this water for me? Okay. Thank you. So the bottom line is this, is that what I did was I concentrated on every inch of my buildings. Every single inch of my buildings I concentrated on. Because if you could put a washer and dryer machine in there, put it in there. But remember, washer and dryer machines, it's a proven fact that for every 12 people, that you have living in a building, a washer and dryer is feasible. If you have less than 12 people in that building, don't do it. 
okay? Because you lose money. So just remember that. And also, uh, you know, when you see little spaces like that, when you see um, garages, then all you have to do is just, you know, build the garages. I get $400 a month for those. I get $100 for each garage, okay, because they have electricity in, you know what I mean, with a, uh, with a light bulb. That's why I get for $100 a month. Otherwise, without electricity, I'd get maybe $50 to $75. You see, little things like that to fatten your bottom line is so, so, so important. Okay? All right. Now, here we go. There's the garages. Wow. All right. Thanks, Eddie. Okay, so those are the garages there. I fixed them up a little bit. You notice that, by the way, do you notice that I have lighting? You notice how I have lighting on all my... Yeah, it is a bad slide. I, what I did was I moved backwards. I shouldn't have. But anyway, the, the bottom line is, is that I put lighting on all my property because, you know, you want them to look good at night. You ever notice a lit building, how beautiful it looks? Mm -hmm. And another thing is, you might have learned this at, at the seminar about 100-watt light bulbs. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It prevents uh, crime, too. Yeah, well, well, that is on the exterior, but on the interior, you know, when you want... <laughs> It's so true, it's so true. But when you have like somebody come through from the housing authority, yeah. something like that, put in all 100 watt light bulbs in the place, turn it on, yeah. and it makes it bright, and it makes it nice. You know, nobody likes gloominess. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And it's like, wow, this is great, yeah. you know? Yeah. And it's like, geez, well, I didn't even paint it. I just put in 100 watt light bulbs now. I'm all, <laughs> you know, but, but the thing is, is that it's true. 100 watt light bulbs, you know, make it look very good, okay? That's something else. Now, the other building, Okay, we're going to just pass all these things. We're going to have to, we got to go forward though. Okay, can you go the other way? Okay, so anyway, so the next building I'm going to show you is another property that I had to use, do without a bank. You know that property with the turret there? You remember that one that I just flashed? It was like a brick building. That one there I did without a bank also. Now, you know, if you can get involved with creative financing the way that I'm showing you, you know, with your knowledge, then these owners of these properties will be willing to give you half their properties, providing if you're having a problem with financing, no problem. You see, if you want to get a couple properties under your belt, make the deals to the people who already own the properties. Then after you do that, then you can go out and get investors and things like that. It'll be absolutely fabulous. All right? I had to do this property here. This, thank you very much. I had to do this property here, okay? This property was with a partner didn't cost me a dime to go into, okay? I got an FHA Title I loan on that. I did this property with a partner. didn't cost me anything because I showed him that I could redevelop this property without him having to take out any money of his own. I could fill up the whole building to 100% occupancy, you see? But remember, these tenants do not come from the housing authority. Housing authority tenants are, I only use the housing authority after these people here you know, let's just say if all of a sudden I redevelop the property, the state gives me the tenants, okay? Now the state, they give me the tenants, and then if I get a vacancy, I go to the housing authority. You see, the housing authority does not have to be in targeted areas, whereas the state rental rehabilitation program for rehabilitation of projects have to be within the targeted areas. Does everybody understand that? Okay, so then, Oh, this property here was really something else, okay? This was on the same block, okay, as all the, you know, Riccio Boulevard, <laughs> okay? So I looked at this property, okay? Now, what happened was is that I saw this particular property here, and I had to get involved with this, uh, you know, the rental rehabilitation program to fix this property up a little bit. Now, this particular property, I didn't have a bank either. So at the time... I worked out a deal with this gentleman for two years. But I said to him I wanted him to get an assumable mortgage from FHA, but he had to keep it for two years. And I said, well, look, now I knew this guy. He was an investor, but he wanted to move down to, you know, another state. So I said to him, look, you know, would you mind doing that? You know, he puts himself into a, you know, a legal situation by doing this. Because if somebody sues, they also, they sue him, you see. So I was the legal rightful owner of this property. And also, we put this property under a corporation, and I purchased the corporation from the person. I eventually, okay, 
th this property eventually is, is, is changed you know, under the names and everything else. But the bottom line is, is that I had a developer help me out, get involved with me by keeping the property under his name until it could be refinanced under my own name or under the corporate name. But in the meantime, I'm the owner of the corporation. So I really am the owner of the corporation, so therefore I own the property, you see? And that's very important, but his name is still on the mortgage. So therefore, he's responsible. If all of a sudden I go fly away to Italy for five years, it's not me that has a problem with the mortgage. He has the problem, and he has to take that chance that I'm not going to play games with him. You see what I'm saying? So, but he, kno he knew me he, you know, and everything else, so he was willing to do the deal. So I went into this property also, okay, without a bank, without having to sit down with the bank. But then what happened was I started to get involved with other financial institutions. First Fidelity Bank, things like that, which is a $30 billion bank. I do not suggest you go to that bank, okay, right now because of their problems in Philadelphia. The whole thing is, is that they like large yeah, projects. Bank. It's easy. That is not even established as of right now, oh. okay, but that is for later use. I have individual banks in individual areas. I have mortgage companies that will deal with you with fixed rate mortgages, okay. Those are the people that you're going to want to deal with. Okay, these adjustable rates will kill you. I have certain financial institutions that will be willing to be totally, you know, to understand these programs completely, depending <coughs> on where you go. Like Perth Amboy, New Jersey, stuff like that. I mentioned Perth Amboy because that's where I started. Okay, I do a lot in Perth Amboy, New Jersey. Okay, now, here's the whole situation. Hello there. The whole situation is, is that now I did this one. I was able to find a good financial institution that was willing to work with me because other financial institutions, okay, I would go there. The interest rates was 16% at the time. Mortgages were hard to get for everybody at the time, okay, no matter who you were. And, and they didn't like investment properties. So I had to be, you know, creative. I had to do these things, folks, and you can do them too. It's as simple as that. This is how I did it. There's no, there's no secrets something, a, a, a little extra ingredient that I'm holding out on you, I'm telling you, this is the way it happened. And it's as simple as that. You know, remember when I said in the seminar, sometimes we make things into a big deal? We make them into such a big deal that we screw up the whole deal. Just do it. Don't make it into a big deal, you see? So now, well, yes, ma'am. How long does it take you to develop one of those homes? Okay, that's why I always say three to four months within the uh, first th uh, time, because remember something. If it's a larger building, it ju I just hire a larger crew. Yes. But we're going to discuss that all with the rent rehab handbook. Believe me, I'm going to cover everything. There's not going to be anything that I'm not going to cover today. Okay? And then and during the questions and answer time, if I, if I did skip something that you want to know on an individual basis, please, I'll talk to you then. Now, timing. Putting yourself into the right place at the right time. Do you remember reading this? Right? It's putting yourself into the right place at the right time. That's timing. Okay, that's what it really is. Oh, well, this, pro <laughs> this property, you know, I, you know, it's funny because I don't know if you listen to, uh, I never changed that, that, that slide there. But do you remember, did, you, did everybody listen to my seminar in Hawaii on the tape? Right, this is the one that I said, oh, this one here, that was really a, it must have been a really like dark property. You know, it was like in dark country or something. I think I said something like that. But, but anyway, Boy, that must have been really bad. Huh? Even, the, even the camera wouldn't even focus in on it. <laughs> but anyway, I wound up fixing that property, and I don't have any before and after pictures. But this property is this particular property on State Street. And State Street property, this is the property that I bought from an estate, someone who passed away. Now, remember the deal that I made $285,000 in three months on? This is the property, okay? This property... I purchased at $150,000. The day I bought the property, it was worth $235,000. See, because I knew how to buy wholesale property through estate sales, right? So I knew what I was doing. So I went over there, okay, and I looked at the property. I said, okay, I know how to buy good, you know, uh, I know how to buy wholesale property, which we're all learning to do. You know, if you might own somebody else's course, like Dave Delgado's course, okay, which I, I recommend. The thing is, is that if you have that course, you're going to learn how to buy wholesale property. Now, all of a sudden, you have wholesale property. Okay, what are you going to do with it? It was worth $235,000 the day I bought it, like I said. That's $85,000 the day I bought it from people who 
it wasn't their building anyway, so they were willing to blow it out for 150. So the property, I, I, I told you all about that, rehabilitation, $90,000, 240000 into it, $45,000 in grant money, left me with 195000 reappraised at four hundred eighty. I'm sorry, not four ninety. Four hundred eighty thousand dollars Okay, my total cost uh, was $195,000, my, my uh, thing, my refinance, and I had $285,000 in equity within the four-month period. Now, remember this word? Do you remember this word? Remember this word in here? Okay. Faith. Faith. You have to have the confidence in, here we go, you have to have the, con you have to have confidence in the ability to do anything you desire. Does everybody have faith? Yes. You have the confidence in the ability to do anything you desire? Mm -hmm. Come on now. Listen, yes, I do. you should be I, at a I certain... people it's a fear. That's right. And the people thing is, you should be at a different level right now. You see, the bottom line is this, is that faith, without faith, we have nothing. Do you have faith that you could go out and buy one of the buildings that I did and do the same thing that I did? Yes, I do. Yes, you do. Does anybody not have the faith? <laughs> yeah, but you know what, though? You know what, though? She's wonderful because you're going to see her. She's going to go out and do it. That's right, Marie. And that's, that's the whole bottom line here. This is what we're trying to My get at today. Is to get with the right people that I don't get stopped. That's right. That's right. I've been stopped so Are you going to go out to the millionaire school? I'm going to go to the trillionaire. All right. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but see, that's. See, see, well, see, but no, that's the. He built the United Nations. Yes, no among kidding. Other buildings. Yes. You know, you know. Actually, that's the that was the school that I was going to start, the Trillionaire School. <laughs> but, but anyway, so so the thing is, is that good? So you'll be my first person there. Right. What we have here, okay, is is someone who you know has the faith in her ability to do anything she desires. Folks, please have that faith. You can't be. You know, I noticed that a lot of people didn't really raise the hand. Of course. Of course you have the faith that you can do these things because you wouldn't be here. Like that. You could snap your fingers and click it out of there. Do you know why you don't have the faith to do anything you desire? Because you've been stopped. Because of the dream destroyers yeah, who tell you that it can't right, be done. Right. You know those right. people who tell you, oh, don't go to those seminars. What are you, crazy? You're only spending right? money for books. Right. right. But look at them. That's right. Yeah. But at the same time, those books are going to make you a lot of, of money. Course. Okay? Of course. You go to college and pay for books. That's right. And you go to college and you spend thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars. And you, and you dollars. Work for other people. That's right. Exactly. You go to college. Work for other people. Exactly. And that's what it's all about. Right? You go to college. You go to college to go out and get a good job. Isn't that right? But I didn't want a good job. I didn't want a good job. So why should I be listening to somebody who makes thirty thousand dollars a year when I could have gotten out, okay, and did something with my life and make my dreams and goals a reality? So have that faith, okay, in that ability that you can do these things. And, and by the, uh, let me tell you, by the end of this day, there's no reason why you can't go out and start with this immediately. That's the bottom line. That's the main thing, okay? So let's go through some of these, these success attitudes. Faith. You have to get rid of fear of poverty, fear of criticism, fear of ill health, fear of loss of love, fear of old age, fear of death. Is anyone f free of these six basic fears? I am. I am. Okay, great. I am. Okay, I am. Look at this. This is all in your book, folks. This is all in the beginning of your book. Please read it. I didn't create my course from page one to page, you know, whatever, for you to flip around. Read it from A through Z. I purposely take you through the steps so this way you will become very successful with this. All righty? Now, here we go. We have fear of poverty. Well, you're here, okay? And the thing is, is that you won't have to worry about the poverty. Just keep on doing what you do. I said something about a big head before. I don't think I'd be here if I had a big head. If I had a big head, I'd be driving around with a Lamborghini. You know what I'm saying? And, and I think that I'd be doing other things like being ruthless and rotten and stepping on people's toes. Mm -hmm. All right? As far, okay, now, now just, just don't worry about it. Fear of criticism. What do you care about the other guy? The other guy... The other guy, they criticize you. Why? Because either jealousy or greed. And as I'm going to say later, I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Jealousy, they're worried so much about or jealousy. That's right. They're so worried about jealousy that what happens is that, is that 
they're so concerned about you, they're so jealous about you, that if they put that same energy into doing what we want to do, yeah. they'd be wealthy, right? Think about all the energy that they waste hating the other person. Yeah. Think about it. Yeah, oh, right that now, Rahul. Right do you, now they hate do you Donald know, Trump. Do you right know, now there's richer people than him. That's right. Do you know, let me, let me just finish all this up and then we'll go into the, the question and answer period. But do you know that, um, that like for instance, people, will say, who does that kid think he is, Neil Arricchio, buying up all that property? Who does he think he is? I heard about him, but they don't know who I am. They don't know me. Don't know you me. see what I'm saying? And that's it. And like, they don't know you, and don't be concerned about them, okay? Fear of ill health. Well, look, when you are financially free, you don't become depressed. And when you're not depressed, you won't get sick, okay? So don't worry about it. Fear of loss of love. Hey, you have your morals straight in your life. Everything else is easy. That's the bottom line. You'll never lose love. Okay? Fear, and I'm not an authority on that, by the way, but I do have a very happy marriage. Okay? But anyway, fear of old age. Hey, we have to get old sometime. That's right. Right? That's right. That's right. But the thing is, is that, is that where will you be at, at that time? You know what I'm saying? Well, all I know is I can't wait till I have my ship off the coast of Greece. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so the thing is, sure, we'll have a big party. Okay, <laughs> it'll, it'll be a big houseboat now. But hey, you know what, that reminds me of something, is that as I got bigger, did you hear Dave Dildano talk about my investments, how I buy a building and I say that's my art building and all my money comes to buy art and that building there, all my building buys coins and that building buys my wine. You know what I'm saying? That building pays for my Visa and MasterCard. Well, that's true. But the thing is, is this, is that, is that as far as uh, you know, I said, uh, you know, you, you're setting that thing up like that. Um, what you have to do, okay, as far as, you know, I, I do that, I set things up for um, uh, my wine list, for this list, for that list. And the thing is, is this. Let me just tell you what happened. I was buying up art. I had to get back on track here. I had a, I, I was buying up art, right, some art. So I walked into this art dealer, and I see this big building, right? It was a plexiglass thing made by Victor Vassarelli, right, from, from France. And he's a very famous pop artist, okay? And uh, so I saw this thing, and it was, you know, thousands of dollars. And I said, thousands of dollars for this thing? And I said, jeez. I said, all right, I'll, I'll get it. So, so I got this thing, right? <laughs> so it was being shipped over I'll from, it was being shipped over from France, right? So as it's being shipped over from France, honest truth, the thing goes up one-third in value within six weeks. I said, every time I buy real estate, no matter what it is, it goes up in value. You know, I mean, isn't that funny? I mean, and that's a true story. You know, so it's like <laughs> real estate. Even if it's a fake building, it goes up, you know? So <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Fear. How many million? 50 million, something like that. That's 80 something. I don't know. What was it, Helene? You don't know? 82 million? I don't know. Something like that. But anyway, fear of death, hey, whatever. But anyway, it's all in the book there. Let's start. We're falling behind time here. Pleasing personality. You know, what are you going to do? Go around buying property with an attitude? You know what I'm saying? Uh, can you imagine? You know, I mean, <laughs> imagine asking someone to defer payments and giving them an attitude about it. They're not going to do it. The thing is, you have to have that pleasing personality. When you go into the bank, have that pleasing personality. That's all. You know, be good to people. Things will come around. You work with people. They give you your terms, okay? They give you your terms, and you give them their price, and it works out because they don't know that our property is going to double and triple in value. You see what I'm saying? That's another reason why I was able to go up there. And as long as you have positive cash flow, what do you care, okay? Personal initiative. You have to do things on your own. Too many times, okay, my personal downfall in the beginning was expecting people to do too many things for me. Now, if it doesn't get done within a certain amount of time, I go out and do it myself. See, you should delegate non-essential things. Essential feats, do yourself. And that's the bottom line. You're going to create your own success. Non-essential feats, just as, such as making phone calls and things like that, okay, are delegated. It's like the man who says to his wife, make these phone calls to the housing authority. 
and, and she doesn't do it for three weeks. So he, she, you know, so, so, so he gets mad at her for not calling up the housing authority after three weeks. Well, about the second week, she, he should have called up the housing authority himself. You see what I'm saying? And that's it. And, that, and that's the bottom line. Now, as far as positive mental attitude. All right, positive mental attitude. Do you know what a positive mental attitude is? You know what these things are, folks? These are, these are the true success, the secrets of success. These are, these are things that are in my, um, in my introduction tape. These attitudes are success attitudes. Live your life by them, please. Can you imagine me being up here not living by these things? You know what I'm saying? A positive mental attitude. Do you think I have a positive mental attitude? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I mean, really, we all have to have that positive mental attitude. It comes with faith. All right? Enthusiasm. Look this up in the dictionary. Look it up in the dictionary. Enthusiasm. Understand the true meaning of this word. And once you start to get it, you're going to really understand the true meaning of it. Okay? I mean, you look it up in the dictionary, you could read the words. But when you get the feeling, boy, you're going to know it. Okay? Controlling your attention. Controlling your attention on your sights. Knowing exactly where you're going from point A to point B. What's the problem? So many people make things into such a big deal. If I gave you right now $10,000 and I said, go, get, go, please go deposit it in the bank, cash, you might go up to your wife or your husband or your friend and go, hey, look, you, know, you just give me 10000 Hey, look at this. I had this little cartoon. You know Family Circus? You ever read that cartoon thing, right? Yeah. So anyway, I saw it one time. I said, I said, look at this. It was a little thing of a boy saying to the mother. The mother said, Jeffy, here's 10 envelopes. And he couldn't believe that she, he wanted, that, that, uh, that, uh, that the mother wanted Jeff, Jeffrey to go to the mailbox to take on responsibility to mail these 10 letters. And all of a sudden, Jeffrey got so excited that he had this responsibility, that he ran around, he jumped up and down, he climbed the ladder, he went down the ladder, he played hopscotch, he went to a construction site and went through this building, <laughs> he jumped over some bushes, right? In the meantime, he's dropping envelopes, <laughs> right? By the time he gets to the, uh, to the mailbox, he said, gee, I thought I had more than this, and he put in three envelopes. The thing is, is that if he just did it, instead of making it into a big deal, what's the problem? Just do it. Don't make it into a big deal. You know what I'm saying? Just do it. I mean, like I said in that seminar in Hawaii with the tricycle, if we all were on tricycles and we had a pot of, pot of gold at the end and the... And the, and the and the wheel fell off, what, are we going to fall down and, and cry and die? No, we're going to go forward, okay? Look, let, let's, let's go through that little, wait a minute now. No, what I wanted to do was I want to tell you, we're going to come up to it, but now's a good time to say it. Write this down, please, and look it up in your book, okay? Well, you don't need, you know, write it down because I want you to learn it, okay? Number one. No, not learn from defeat. I want you to write this down. I will not quit. No matter how much pain and how many problems I encounter. Because those things are nothing compared to my desire. You understand that? Yes. Okay. Oh, boy. That, that is like... That is like so important to me, okay? I will not quit. Yeah, I will not quit. No matter, that's under persistence on page 17 in your book. All right, but write it down to get to know it. Meaning, if we had that tricycle and we were going down the street and all of a sudden our wheel fell off, what are we going to do? We're not going to fall over and cry. What we're going to do is just keep on going, you see, because... Isn't that pot of gold more important to us than that tricycle, that wheel falling off? Isn't those little problems of each and every day nothing compared to you making your life financially free? Isn't it? I know it was to me, and I did what I had to do. You see what I'm saying? All right. Now, also, learning from defeat. You heard about Thomas Edison, right? When he was asked... How did you ever create the incandescent light bulb? Remember when we created the incandescent light bulb? I mean, really, can you think about a guy just creating a light bulb and saying, well, what we have to do is make a vacuum? And 
Can you imagine that, what it would take? And he said, well, he said, he, one thing, he, when they said to him, how did you ever create the incandescent light bulb? He said, because I failed so many times that I was bound to get it right. Imagine if we all had that wonderful attitude. A woman said to him, you're not smart. It took you 10,000 tries to do that. He said, well, ma'am, I'll show you 9,999 ways not to make a light bulb. Okay? So imagine if we went through life. He was a dropout. Can you imagine if we went through life with this wonderful attitude, where do we be? Isn't that something else? Budgeting your time. You've got to be able to plan your day through essential feats, important feats, non-essential feats, okay, or miscellaneous. Like in your Freedom Planner, that booklet that you see me carrying around all the time. I recommend this highly. I really do. I recommend this highly because it'll give you your plan of the day and keep you on track, okay? If you have to just pass them over to the next day, then that's fine, all righty? Now, this particular property, okay, reminds me of persistence. And it, those of you who didn't get that, I will not quit no matter how much pain and how many problems I encounter because those things are nothing compared to my desire. Isn't that something else? Isn't that something else? It's so important. That particular property for persistence took me over a year, almost a year, to purchase that property, but I had persistence. The guy asked $450,000. Okay, I went down to the tax office. Read it in your book. Read it in your book on page 17. The story on how I went out and I, for one year, went from $450,000, I was able to purchase the property for two oh five. dollars one about a year later. Because I had persistence, I stuck with it. I went down to the local tax office. Remember what I said about the local tax office? I went down to the local tax office and I figured out how much, not the, t the tax assessor's office. I went down and I suggest that you do this before you buy any property. Go to your local tax assessor's office, take a look at how much money, you know, take a look at the, uh, the, the property and ask to also see the deeds of the property. Say you want to know the taxes of this property. And say, by the way, can I see the deed? When you see the deed, you'll know how much money they paid for the property and what year they bought it for. So if you knew that a year earlier that this guy paid $115,000 for a property and now all of a sudden he's asking $450,000, you, know you know that you have some negotiation factor there, right? You know what I'm saying? So based on income, I told him I'd only offer him $175,000. He said, come on, no way. So after all this time, people trying to get, make him offers and not following through, after all the time, I said to him, well, look, he was getting desperate after almost a year later, after seeing him like weekly. I said to him, look, he said, well, he said to me he wanted 225000 he came down to. I said, I'll give you 205 if you pay, if you hold back $50,000 in a deferred payment and you pay all of my closing costs. Now, he agreed. I was willing to pay him 230000 for the building. Okay, I want you to understand that. I bought it at 205. Okay? And the bottom line is, is that I had the persistence and you should have the persistence. So just because you go to these properties and just because they're asking too much money, so what? So if you make a hundred offers based on cash flow, based on income of the property, you will know you'll know you'll get at least five. My track record was so good. Every property in the beginning that I ever looked at, I was buying. I was buying, I was buying, I was buying, I was getting the deal. You know what I'm saying? It was like every four out of five properties, every five properties that I looked at, I was getting four deals. You know what I'm saying? And that's excellent. And other people I know, for every 10 they look at, they get three deals. But you're going to be making so much money in, the, in, this, in this business. You're going to be doing so well that isn't it worth to do a little bit of work? You know what I'm saying? A lot of people say to me, well, I don't, you, you know, oh, it's, it's hard work, it's hard work. But for every three hours that I work hard, I'll make three years of what the average person makes. You know what I'm saying? So just understand that. I, I started off in the beginning working on the weekends. Then I started to work every day looking at property, every day. It moved down to three hours a day. Then it moved down to about a half an hour a week, okay? 
the thing is in three hours a week, so on and so forth. Because the more you get to know, you never have to look at another property again. After the first eight months of you buying property, six months, eight months, you'll never have to look for another property again. I'm telling you this, you'll never have to look for another property again. People came to me. People came to me with deals saying to me, you know, oh, you know, I'm, a, I'm an attorney. Look, I got this guy going broke. I got this person who passed away. So you're buying the properties. The thing is, is that they know that you're in the market. They need people like you, you see? And that's it. I don't ever have to look at another property again. That warehouse that I bought, yes, well, I didn't buy it yet. I, I signed on it yesterday. The warehouse was, you know, it was a warehouse there. I just happened to uh, get a phone call that this property burnt on top of this building. So I bought the building. So next door to it is a warehouse. So I heard about the warehouse being for sale. I said, no, not really. So I sent, anyway, so I was a little interested, and I, I sent my architect over there. He told me what I could do with it, going up two stories, making it into a, a senior citizen housing project. So the guy, then he, we sat down, and I heard that the hospital wanted to buy it. So I sat down with the guy the other day and his brother-in-law. We signed up a contract yesterday. I submitted it to him. It was accepted. And then, and then uh, he said, by the way, do you want this building here? It's 20,000 square feet, blah, blah, you know, where, his, where you know, he has his office and his shop at. And I said, well, one deal at a time, we'll take it from there. Now, the bottom line is, is that, is that uh, I fell into it. I just fell into it. You fall into these situations. You hear things. You'll be at a diner having a cup of coffee, and you'll hear somebody talking about their deal. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and you just say, well, hey, look, how about we do this or do that? And you just get into it. I'm telling you that right now. All right? Now, th this is the particular property that I'm going to be working on soon, okay? I just, I couldn't start it because in this particular city, there is a sore moratorium. And a sore moratorium means that you cannot do any building, okay? You cannot do any building whatsoever in this particular town until they fix the sewer lines and increase the, to increase the usage. So this is the building next door to that, and there's a vacant piece of land in between. So right now I have control of all that, and I have a nice piece of land behind it. This is what the building is going to look like. This is that red building. This is where that bar is. I'm going to extend the building backward and connect the two buildings together. This is also going to be senior citizens, okay? And in the back, there's going to be a park-like setting with parking and garages. And, and also, I'm working on a deal behind that parking lot right now. I just hope that, that I'm able to get that building if, if the deal will go through eventually, OK? And uh, that's that. So that's what I'm working on there. Hopefully, I'm able to get in control of all the properties behind it, OK? Now, risk. We're going to be taking a break in about, uh, in about five minutes, just so you know. So, you know, if you, you, know, you can go if you want, but, but we're going to be taking a break real soon, 15-minute break. Risk, okay? Now, what did I say about risk? Take intelligent risks, okay? Risk equals gambling, throwing the dice, okay? Intelligent risk equals real estate. I have never seen a property disappear. You know what I'm saying? It will have a value and it can be sold. Always. I've seen a pro gambling, right? Rolling the dice, right? To me, is a business. Oh, I want to do this new business. I want to do this. I want to do that with this business, with this business. I'm a businessman, right? People say, I want to open up a business. I want to open up a restaurant. I've seen $10 million businesses go to zero. I've seen $100 million stock portfolios go to zero. I've never seen a real estate, a piece of real estate, go to zero. You see? And, I, and I, as I said before, I've never woken up and seen a property disappear. You know what I'm saying? And that's it. So I bought, this is a single family home. Okay, other properties. Okay, this particular property I'm working on right now, this one here. As a matter of fact, I had a deal on this particular property. That's right behind this here, this one, uh, that, that complex that's going up. I had a contract on that. We lost it, so now I'm going through a, a different name. So we'll see what happens with that particular property. OK? Goals. Everybody here has goals? You have goals? OK? Have you decided upon a definite goal in life?
Don't just say, I want to be rich. Say, I want $1 million by the end of this year. Be definite, okay? Have you set a time limit for reaching that goal? Don't say, someday I'm going to be a millionaire. At the end of this year, I'm going to have $1 million. You see? Have you determined what definite benefits your goal in life will bring you? Prosperous in peace, prosperous in love, rich in romance, right? Health, what is it? You see what I'm saying? Freedom. That's what it's all about, financial freedom, okay? What definite benefits your life will bring you? Being mm -hmm. able to send my wife, being able to send my children away and go here to go there to give them a better life. These are the definite benefits in, in, in your life, okay? So write those down. These are all in your course. I want you to write them on a pe separate piece of paper. Please, you don't know how important these are in your life. You don't know how important goals are. They really work. They really work. It's amazing. When you find an opportunity, as I say a million times, when you find an opportunity, don't make it into a big deal. Just do it. And there's no reason why you can't become successful with this. These few properties that I'm showing you are the begin is the beginning of my investment career. Now I'm able to do those deals because now I'm solid. You ever hear that that saying that you can't hang a swing on a tree the next day, you know, the day after you plant it? You have to get that solidness there. That's very important before you go out and conquer 100 unit buildings and 30 30 unit buildings unless you have a partner who knows what they're doing. So if any of you brought me a good deal, then sure, then it's a different story. All right, but then again, it's called personal initiative. And if you find the greatest deal in the world and are wasting your time looking for someone to back you on the deal, you're losing valuable time where you can go out by yourself and do such deals like this. Because after only six months, you'll get a reputation that you know what you're talking about and people will then come to you. And people will then say to you, look, I want to be a partner, this, that, and the other thing. You know, after about six months, I never had to look for a property. I remember driving around 3 o'clock in the, in the morning looking for properties, just looking for for sale signs and everything because I just couldn't sleep. I was so excited about it. And I would drive around and look and look and look and talk to real estate agents and search. But then only a few months later, they all called me. I had attorneys calling me up. I had agents calling me up. So I never actually, right now, I don't have to look for a property. I'll get a phone call and say, look, this one needs money. That one has a problem. This one passed away. And then I choose. It's up to me. And then if the numbers work, I don't buy property. I buy numbers. If the numbers work, I buy it. It's as simple as that. Because I could care less what I have to do with it as long as I have the knowledge of hiring competent people to fix it for me, the problems. And if I'm going to receive grant money that's for free that I never have to pay back, then why should we ever buy a property that we can't receive grant money for? Unless if it's in a hospital area or if it's in a, you know, I mean, a hospital is very important. I own properties in hospital areas. I can always rent them out to doctors. I can surely rent them out to nurses like I always do. Okay? I mean, these are good rental markets. I don't receive grant money for that. But I understand, don't forget, we're in this business to do what we're here for. And that is become the person we were meant to be and make our dreams and goals a reality. Not say, hey, listen, buddy, I just, made, I, I just bought this property. In 15 years from now, I'm going to make a $300,000 profit. Now, what is that? If you want to buy a piece of land that is such a beautiful deal that you'll have a negative cash flow on, do yourself a favor. Buy a property refinance the property, okay? Make sure you have a positive cash flow. Use that money to purchase that land or use that money to per put a deposit on that land if you can't use creative financing. And with your positive cash flow, use that to, build your, to, to, uh, to buy your property. Let me tell you a story about this gentleman who came up to me and he said to me, hey, Neil, I just did this real estate deal. I'm so excited. I just bought a Mercedes cash. It was a great, great, you know, I got this beautiful, he got this special gold edition. It was like $80,000 of the car. Beautiful car. I said, why did you buy it cash? He said, because I did a deal and I took the money from that and I bought it cash. I said, well, let me ask you a question. Wouldn't you rather have put $10,000 down on that, that 
car. Maybe it would have cost you, let's just say, a thousand a month. With that $80,000, go out and find a multifamily that has a tremendous cash flow, which with $80,000, that's a, you know, you, you, I, could, I could find your deals a dime a dozen. Go buy yourself a 10 family home, get the cash flow from that property, and pay for that car payment. Because then you'll have appreciation on your home and it'll increase in value. Right? Instead of that car. That car is for ego and it's not for profit. I was going to go out one time and spend $120,000 on a car, and I said, wait a minute now. I said, is this for profit or is this for ego? I said, well, you know, maybe it is for profit because then. You know, people will, I'll be able to drive up the bankers and stuff. And then I said, wait a minute, who am I kidding? I don't care about no bankers, what they think. The fact is, is that I'll go out and buy more property. Then maybe I'm, you know, I'm 26 years old. Maybe when I'm 30, then I'll buy the Lamborghini. But, <laughs> but no, I'm only kidding. But, but the whole thing is, is that there's no reason for that. You know, after what, well, once you have it and you're able to afford these things, you realize that you're just trying to impress the common person. Who's the common person? The common person is broke. The common person is worried about paying their bills. Why should I impress those people? Why should you impress those people? You know what I say? I say do everything opposite that the common person does and maybe you'll become successful. Write this down. I will not quit no matter how much pain and how many problems I encounter because those things are nothing compared to my desire. Nothing compared to my desire to win, to do anything that I want, okay? So if I gave you all tricycles, and if I put a pot of gold right here, and you were coming down and that back wheel popped off, what are you gonna do, roll over and lie down and say, I can't, I can't? You're going to get up and carry that thing because you want that pot of gold so bad that that wheel isn't any big deal. It's no big thing. Just do it. Just do it. You know, it reminds me of a story that I went, I had a, I, you, know, you know, I look at so many people in the airport, frantic, running and jumping and leaping and all these other things and pushing people out of the way and all this. You know, one time I missed my airplane. So my wife and I were over in Maui, and I missed my, I, I'm sorry, I was, in, I was in Kona. I was in Hawaii. I was going to Maui. And I missed the airplane. First time in my life I missed the airplane. So what I did was I walked to the next counter and I bought another ticket. When you have a problem, just deal with it, folks. Say to yourself, just deal with it. If you just deal with it, you'll be able to just do it. And then I see the guy going, oh, I lost my plane, I missed my plane, boom, 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 going crazy, when he could have just walked over and bought another ticket or traded in his ticket to get a later flight. Big deal. So then you go on the phone and make some phone calls, okay, or whatever. That's all. Just deal with it. Just deal with it. Just deal with it. You have to decide upon a definite goal in life. Folks, I don't want you to be vague. I don't want you to tell me that your goal in life is to be worth, is to be a millionaire. I don't want to hear that. Write that down. I want you to have a goal in life. I want to have $2 million worth of real estate within the next six months. Be specific. Come up with a plan of how you're going to do that, and you will do it. So have a definite goal in life. Have you set a time limit for reaching that goal? Don't say that. Someday I'm going to be worth $2 million. Say six months, I'm going to be worth $2 million. Have that direct, that, that, that direct time. Know it. Have you determined what definite benefits your goal in life will bring you? I want to be prosperous in peace. I want to be prosperous in wealth. I want to be rich in romance. I want to love. I want to have that love for my wife as I give her my love. These are the benefits. It's not all about money. It's about being happy, having that peace. That's what financial freedom is. It gives you that peace of mind. Okay? When you find an opportunity, don't make it into a big deal. 
Just do it. And there's no reason why you can't become successful with this.